This week on Crossfeed. How do you confirm a vision of Mary? What do you have when you separate Jesus from Christ? How should Christians respond to the gay community? Liturgy. Ooh, what is it good for? <laughs> Putting in God we trust on money. On the signature of a check. Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Crossfeed. Actually, maybe the second one this week. <laughs> <laughs> so the one we did Sunday uh, has been real delayed. It's a problem with my ISP and getting it to Dale. So, uh, well, yeah, we'll it's uh, it it's actually as I record this, I'm using my wife's computer to um, to do the podcast. My computer is importing the video into iMovie so I can edit it. Um, and it's probably going to take all night, so, which means Friday morning it'll be ready to go. So I'll be editing it uh, part of the day Friday, but I got some stuff I get done. So that'll probably come out like Friday night, which you'll know by the time you get this one. And then this one will probably come out like Saturday or Sunday, depending how long it takes to um, to actually get the stuff transferred over. Um, so, yeah. so, yeah, it's big drought and then all of a sudden boom <laughs> so uh this kind of reminds me of our delays there delays and all of a sudden catches up real fast um yep. anyway you will uh yeah hopefully if i have any trouble getting this one to you tomorrow night uh we have to go to a party so i might take it over to the church and plug it in over there because i don't have any problems I, I don't have any problems but we'll see what happens when we try it from here um Otherwise, you'll have to go park in like a hotel parking lot and leech off of their their wireless. <laughs> yeah, actually, there's a McDonald's not far from here. It's got a real good DSL. I could leech off it for an hour and a half. There you go. Just go in there and buy some coffee or something. Aren't you wired online surfing the web? Okay. So where should we um, begin? I don't know. Oh, let's let, let's start with this uh, name change here. I think this is this is pretty good. Um, of course, if my name, last name was Kreutzer, I think I might want to, um, oh, is that him? Yep. Yeah, I found his picture. Man, I wouldn't only want a name change, I'd want a face change, but oh well. <laughs> hey, hey, that's not <laughs> nice. You are ugly when you're angry. No, it's not nice. Sorry now. True, but it's not <laughs> nice. Anyway, uh. Can't he at least smile? I mean, it looks like he's not happy well, at all. That would be good. For some reason, I don't glasses. have a story in front of me, but it's a short one. What's his What's his current name? Steve Kreischer is his current name. He's from Zion, Illinois. And he has asked the judge to legally change his name to In God We Trust. Right. With In God being his first name and We Trust being his uh, last name. And uh, he says, well, um, you know, God's been really good to me. He's he's helped me through some rough spots and that. And so uh, I want to change my name to to reflect that. And also, since, you know, the atheists are trying to get in God we trust off of the money, um, we want to make sure it's preserved somewhere. <laughs> it, you know, it'll be on his gravestone then <laughs> someday. Yeah. Now, what is this? Yeah. What is this? You know, my, my friends call me God for short. Uh, yeah. <laughs> of course, they've got some other great names here people have asked to have their names changed to. Uh, Santa Claus, GoVeg.com, Megatron, Optimus Prime, Pro-Life, Low Tax, and, of course, Jesus Christ. So... Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Just call her Pro for short. See what I what I'm waiting for is somebody that um, that offers to uh, change their name, um, like on eBay, you know, and, and get some sort of corporate name. Although I can't imagine, like for instance, you know, oh, I want to change my I'll I'll change my name. You pay me like a certain amount of money. I'll change my name to Coca Cola. You know. But then, like, this person does something really horrible. 
Coca Cola kills ten people, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, I don't think they'd want to do something like that. <laughs> kind of like kind of like uh, what they're doing with sports stadiums and uh, uh, local arenas and. Uh, well, yeah, you, you remember you, when the bowl games used to be named after like fruit and like you know sugar bowl and and you know and, and stuff like that, and now it's like the Carfax Bowl and the you know whatever it's like. You oh, know, no, these, they're all corporate names. It's the FedEx Orange Bowl. And it's the Mobile oh, yeah. Cotton Bowl. And yeah, but one of, them's, one of them's not even... It's just the corporate name. Is it? Okay. Um, I can't, can't remember. But uh, I remember when they first started doing that, and um, it was interesting because the network that it was being carried on would call it the FedEx Orange Bowl. Everybody else just called it the Orange Bowl. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's the... Um, oh, what's the one with that's like mails you stuff every day? Um, what's in your wallet? It's a credit card company. Oh, Capital One? Yeah, the Capital One Bowl. And that's not, that's just the Capital One Bowl. So, I don't know. I mean, up here, um, it was, uh, um, we had a new arena built and it was called the Fleet Center. It was named by Fleet Bank. Of course, they got bought out, so they needed another corporate name and, um, Bank North got it. And he called it the, uh, the Bank North Garden. Um, which the nice part about that is, is it was Boston Garden for so many years. People just call it the Garden. So people, again, just call it the Garden. The know, Garden. The the garden. <laughs> so everybody was really happy that name was returned. Uh, they were just ecstatic <laughs> that that, that the name's called the Garden again. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, a lot of them, they'll have these, these, these corporate names. But I think this is kind of silly, you know. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, okay, God's been good to me. Okay, I can say that, but, you know, that's not a night. I mean, this is getting silly to be called In God We Trust. I, I'm thinking, like, put it on a t-shirt. Yeah. Like, there was just, did you see that story um, about the kid who got a Brett Favre uh, jersey, and he wore it for, like, four years straight? I mean, like, his mom washed it and stuff, you know? But every day, that's what he wore? No, uh-huh, I know. And, I um... That. Yeah, he got it when he was like seven, and he's been wearing it for four years, and I think he got it for his seventh birthday, and so he finally took it off and, you know, kind of retired it, in a sense, and, um, because it was getting kind of snug. <laughs> he's a growing boy, you know, and the shirt's not growing, <laughs> and, uh, so, so yeah, I'm thinking, you know, like that, if, if you really want to do something like that, just get a shirt that says it, and then you can, um, you know, you then you can... You could just wear that shirt all the time. Just make sure to, you know, take it off and wash it. Yeah. And by the way, anybody who's upset about my re- remark about the way this guy looks, just take away, look at the way I look. I mean, it's, you know, it's not much better. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah well, you know, that's, I always say better. that if you're going to tell, uh, like a, a, a racial joke or something like that, you can only do, um, a, a, an org, a group that you're actually a member of. <laughs> so, you know, Jim tells ugly jokes. So. <laughs> I admit it. <laughs> I have a face that only a mother can love. Oh, well, not my mother. But that's besides the point. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. So at least this guy wanted, you know, wants something there with in God we trust. At least he thinks there's something there. Uh, as opposed to um, Greta Vosper at the West Hill United Church in Toronto, who wants to have Christianity without Christ. You're speaking of how people look. Take a look at her. She reminds me like if, if you gene spliced Hillary Clinton and Laura Bush. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not saying she's ugly or anything. Just, just take a look at her. Like if if those two, you know, we're moving in that direction now that um, that that you can take, you know, uh, uh, two eggs and and uh, and and put them together in a test tube kind of deal, All right? I'm telling you, if if somebody did that with with Hillary and Laura, that's what that's what you end up looking like. Reminds me of um, Spy Magazine's old thing called Separated at Birth. And yeah, there you yeah, go. yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah. 
Actually, the previous guy kind of reminded me of a separated of birth of uh, the Atlantic District President Dave Banke. He kind of kind of reminded me of how he looked. Yeah, he really does look like Dave. <laughs> Dave's got about much that much hair, and his chin looks a lot like that. He, they they could pass as <laughs> separated at birth. Anyway, back to this. Um, Greta Vosper <sighs> yeah. at West Hill United Church in Toronto, where there is no cross. Uh, just a giant non-religious rainbow tapestry and multicolored streamers hanging from the ceiling. Oh, no, there's a cross, but it has no special meaning. Oh, okay. I got a bad feeling about this. It's uh, it's there for, um, there's a few older congregants for whom the Bible and the cross are still nice symbols, so they remain there. Yeah, um, yeah. She, um, <clears throat> she says, the central story of Christianity will fade away. The story about Jesus as the symbol of everything that Christianity is will fade away. Yep. She's, uh, there's symbols that hold the church back from breaking into the future to a time when the label Christian won't even exist and the church will be freed from the burdens of the past. Well, I like this thing that Jesus is a Middle Eastern peasant with a few charismatic gifts and a great posthumous marketing team. Yeah. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. Anybody object to that? <laughs> Any, I'm like, I'm sorry, put your hands back on the wheel. I know some of you are driving while you're listening to this. <laughs> this is, I mean, you know, the, the goofy thing is, is we talked about the same kind of deal last time with uh, uh, David Verhoeven or whatever his name is. And, um, you know, it's this idea that, well, you know, Jesus was a was a, a nice guy, and, and we follow his teachings. Well, some of them, <laughs> like, the. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is but, craziness, though. Here, once again, here's, here's, you know, I mean, what's the meaning of Christianity? It's, you know, uh, it's a transformative element in individuals' lives and communities. Um that was the root of what the Christian church was about, transforming the way people see themselves in relation to the communities around them, in relation to each other, and living in that community. Christianity took over that story, manipulated it into a very different story. I can get that in the health self-help seminar. Mm -hmm. I can get that, you know, at the Democratic National Convention, or the Republic <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> Oprah's promoting a, a book right now that um, they can give you that. I mean, here's here's the problem that she you know really has messed up is is and I was talking my Bible class this last Sunday. What does the church have that no one else does? I mean, if you Grace. want to talk about transforming community, you know, and, and that kind of stuff, anybody could do that. It can be you know anywhere from the Christian church to the Rotarians. It doesn't make any difference. What does the church have to offer nobody else does? Uh, you know, you say you, you use the term grace. I use the term forgiveness, real forgiveness from God. Um, I was mm -hmm. telling Dale before the show that we interviewed this uh, guy uh, for uh, the ministry today, and his wife was raised Roman Catholic. And uh, so we asked her, uh, uh, very devout, very culturally conservative Roman Catholic. I mean, he's, she's, you know, I don't know how many brothers and sisters she has, but she kind of, from what she said, it was a fairly large family. I mean, just this, this really, uh, but she said, one thing I really like about the Lutheran Church is its centrality of grace and the surety of salvation that's proclaimed, that we can know wow. for sure we're going to heaven. So, and She's Roman really Catholics, got her head wrapped around it. Yeah, says, Roman Catholics really don't have that. You know, said, she goes, most of them I don't. She goes, well, my grandfather died. Every, he and my grandmother and everybody was really praying to Mary. And she says, and that was before I, I changed churches. And she says, I was really struggling then with, with this prayer to all these people to Mary. I was like, you know, my death, I don't want to pray to Mary. I don't know that Jesus is alive in there. Um, mm -hmm. So I just was really impressed by her answer. I mean, she just she shouldn't know what she's talking about. She's a PhD in church music, um, <laughs> history of church music. I mean, just a very, very uh, literate young woman. But, you know, here, that's it. That's what the church is all about that we can offer people grace and forgiveness. I mean, this kind of stuff that she's talking about, this is stupid. Mm -hmm. 
And and if you look at it, it's all law. Oh, absolutely. It's you know it's it's be, be good, do this stuff, you know, and and, and for nothing. She offers no salvation, hmm. you know, and and if you fail to live up to these ideals, sorry, can't help you. Right. I well, mean, you know, there's well, no forgiveness. It's a, it's a, it's a gospel transforming community, and that's what, you know, and your relationship to that community. That's it. It's all about what what happens here. And when you die, you die. Um, th- there is no- nothing there. There is no. There can only be law. Because that's all she has to offer anybody. Hey, man, this don't feel right. My donkey senses are tingling all over. I thought it was funny because she's part of the United Church of Canada. And <laughs> the uh, president of that body, David Guliano, uh, said if he felt the way she, sh- she does, he would not be a minister. But it's not his job to condemn. All right. So anybody out there, and, you know, United Church of Canada, United Church of Christ, these are... Um, you know, kind of sister organizations, right? You know, if you're a member of one of these organizations, I'm not saying your congregation is like this. I'm not saying your pastor is like this. But look at this organization. What is wrong with this organization, right? You know, if you want to be a member of this organization, fine. But I would challenge you to do something about it, you know, take a stand and say this is not going to be tolerated. This is ridiculous. Well, you know, you got to draw a line somewhere. Part of the problem is their polity, because their polity is strict, pretty strict congregationalism. The really the the overarching authority has no power. Uh, you know, and I, I I basically the only thing you can do is leave. I mean, that's basically your only thing as a church is is to leave, um, because it's every kind of every church for itself. It's, it's, we don't have that synodical polity where we have these covenants of love that we need to, you know, follow and, and be together beyond congregational autonomy. It's congregational autonomy, period. But I, I mean, I there was a guy in uh, Springfield, and, oh, you know, wonderful, wonderful preacher of the gospel. He really was um, a black guy and uh, just just raised his church from practically nothing when he got there till. They were on Easter. They would fill the Springfield Arena. I mean, it was just just incredible. And mm. so he he spoke at our church one time on prison ministry. We were holding having this holding this conference on uh, how how do we help with, with prisons and th- prison ministries and things. And his church had a very active one, doing Bible studies up there. And, and many men, men in his um, church were former uh, jail, prisoners, guys who'd be in jail that they came to Christ through their ministry. And I asked him, I said, how do you, how do you deal with being in the United Church of Christ? I mean, you know, where you are and where they are, are two different places. Where you are and the other UCC guys in on this town are in different places. He goes, I leave them alone and they leave me alone. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I remember though, um, one C- UCC guy who, you know, talked about, um, you know, his sermons would be about um, Sandinistas back in the 1980, and was you know they they were such a great thing. Um, and um, my favorite, um, a friend of mine, his UC, a guy he knew who was UCC. The guy told him he was a deist, and the people came to him. And um, when the, the guy was older, he's in his 50s. Although for me, that's not much. Not too long away, far away, but uh, his grandfather, his grandson, was going in for surgery, and they said, "Well, Pastor, shouldn't we pray for your grandson?" And his answer was, "Well, to who and for what?" This is madness. You know, Jim, we're going to need to um, uh, on, on most podcasts, what they would do is have a drinking game. <laughs> Every time Jim tells a story that you've already heard on this show drink we're not encouraging that though so yeah <laughs> i've got uh, tea here <laughs> i don't so it, anyway uh, it's a good story and I, i'm sorry i didn't mean to pick on you no um, no i don't i don't always know which ones i've told and which ones i haven't but i mean it's serious it's, it's just it's just silliness it really is mm-hmm. um yeah 
pray for her, pray for her congregation. I really, I feel really bad for them. I feel bad for, you know, sometimes you, you, you wonder why are these people still hanging around? And, you know, and I've talked to people that were stuck at congregations like that and, um, where, you know, they run away from the creed as, as they put it here. And, um, and, and, and they say, you know, like talking to a guy said, my daughter is going to be going into confirmation class and, and they're, I mean, their so-called pastor was basically a Wiccan. <laughs> and, and he's like, I don't want this witch teaching my daughter catechesis. And, um, and so he's, he's like, but the thing is, my family's been members of this congregation for years, you know, and for generations. And it's only a matter of time before she leaves and we can get somebody else in here. But, you know, until that time, what do I do? You know, and, and so people, they, they want to, they want to support their church, but not necessarily their pastor. I'm not sure what you can do. I mean, as far as, I guess I don't know enough about, uh, congregationalism to know what they can do is, you know, in our church, if, if a pastor is teaching false doctrine, you remove that pastor. And, and, you know, if, if, if you can prove that, that he's teaching false doctrine and, and, uh, he's confronted with it and refuses to repent, it's, it's a pretty simple process to get rid of him. But, um, you know, in, in a situation like this, I, I'm not sure if there's anybody out there that's a member of a UCC church and you're familiar with how this works, uh, definitely send us an email and, uh, and let us know. Cause I'd be interested to know what you do here. But the thing is, it sounds like she's kind of got people duped. You know, you hear this stuff and, and you kind of brainwash them. You kind of slowly work into it. And, um, you know, pretty soon you've, you've got them switched over. You know, so it's, it's very sad. The problem is really she doesn't believe scripture. Maybe she would believe if they could confirm scripture. Like they just confirmed a 17th century apparition of the Virgin Mary. There you go. Say, that Not sure how, how you segue. do that. Though. What? Yeah, it was. <laughs> we talked about praying to Mary before, but then we got off of that. So. Yeah. This is, you've probably heard of different, uh, there's, let's see, Our Lady of Lourdes and Our Lady of, uh, was it Guadalupe? Guadalupe and, and, all right, well, this is, um, this would be, be, I guess, Our Lady of, um, the, the Alps. Mm -hmm. Um, the French Alps. Um, according to the story, uh, you have a, a 17th century shepherd girl in the French Alps. Uh, her name was in my stilted high school French. Um, Benoit or Benoit, uh, Ronquel. So if there's any French speakers out there, Roman Catholics, um, that know how to pronounce this, let us know. Send us a, a voicemail or, or, uh, you know, an MP3 file or something. Um, but, uh, uh, Monsignor Jean-Michel de Falco Leandri. That sounds more Italian than, <laughs> than French. Um, he said he recognized the supernatural origin of these apparitions, which appeared from 1664 to 1718. And, uh, so on France Info Radio, he said the decision meant that the church has committed itself in an official way to say the pilgrims or to say to pilgrims, you can come here in total confidence. Of what? Why are you messing with the fantasy? We know about the reality. Don't ruin the fantasy, okay? I don't know. I guess total confidence <laughs> that there actually was a apparition there. And people come there to take baths and, um, you know, for healing and things. Um... You know, um, they have 120,000 pilgrims a year. I, I don't know. I mean, this is this is just weird stuff here. Um, the recognition process involves a panel of experts, including two theologians and an investigating judge. 
What do they read? I mean, how do they, how do you investigate something that happened, you know, uh, 300 years ago? I'm, with all due respect, I'm picturing uh, Egon Spengler holding a little meter and the little arms go. <laughs> I've been slimed. <laughs> <laughs> You know, especially the fact that this happened, you know, Virgin 300 Mary years ago. Who are you going to call? <laughs> Have you noticed an increase in those lately? I mean, it, I was, what was it? it? There was one on the news here today, yes, today, I think, or yesterday, and then, uh, or last night on our uh, uh, 5 o'clock news, 6 o'clock, whatever, um, and and then and I I had just posted like two of them the crossfeed, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, man they're coming out of the woodwork literally. <laughs> or in this it's case, crazy. The cave. Yeah. So I. <laughs> you know the, the the sad thing to me is that it's this need for these apparitions and apparitions and things like this to make the faith more sure. You know there is nothing more sure. In Christ's death and resurrection. You know, there mm-hmm. is nothing more sure than what he has done for us. And it's really based on, you know, what what he says. Uh, Peter, you know, um, I'm a Dave Barry fan. And I love, you know, when Dave Barry makes the, the comments sometimes, you know, we are not making this up. You know, mm-hmm. Peter, in his uh, second letter, says that we were on the holy mountain. We saw him transfigured. And well, this is, you know, and, and no scripture has its beginning in the, in any spirit of a person, but rather men and women were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And, um, <clears throat> you know, basically Peter is saying, we're not making this up. John says in his letter, what we have seen, what we have touched, this we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. Yeah, we're not making this up. We saw it, we felt it, we touched it. It's real. Uh, based on their eyewitness testimony. It wasn't somebody, you know, 300 years later saying, oh yeah, it really happened. Right. Yeah, these are eyewitness accounts. You know, here's the thing. When I'm looking for, you know, when, I, when I'm experiencing doubt of some kind and, and, and I want proof that this is not just, something that some guys made up, right? What do I do? I go into scripture. I look at the prophecies. I look at their fulfillment in Christ. All right. And for me, that's the proof. Okay. The, all the archaeological evidence, that doesn't hurt. But, you know, I, I don't believe that the church rises and falls on archaeology. Okay. I don't need three Holy Ghostbusters to tell me that, you know, well, uh, uh, apparition appeared here, you know, some phantom, and, um, you know, which we're not supposed to communicate with the dead anyway. And so, oh, well, but I suppose, wait, wasn't Mary assumed like Elijah, kind of, or Enoch, according to the official Roman Catholic teaching? Um, actually, as Roman Catholic teaching later on, at the, in the 16th, 17th century, that was not official Roman Catholic teaching, though I think it was kind of in the popular belief. You're quasi-evil. You're semi-evil. You're the margarine so. of evil. So. Uh, yeah, you know, if you, if you want to find God, then you'll find him in his word. That's where he's promised to be found. You know, they're not even saying you're going to find God here. You're just going to find uh, uh, um, uh, that this is a place where a dead woman's supposed to leave you. And how they can prove it, you know, I'm looking at it going, well, gee, this, you know, that's what everybody wants it to be the case. And you'll be popular if you say, yeah, this is what happened. But otherwise, I, you know... You could say, well, it's because there's all these healings or whatever that have happened there. But I'm sorry, that's not proof to me. Because if the devil really wants to heal people, he can do that. Mm-hmm. You know, 
if it means that it's going to turn them away from Christ, if it's going to make them look for, you know, look for Mary instead, he could appear that way, you know? So I just, I, and, and in fact, frankly, you know, Paul says test the spirits and, and see if they point to the resurrected Christ, right? This doesn't. No. This in no way points to the resurrected Christ or Christ coming into the flesh. Right? This points to Mary. And and it's going to turn people away from Christ and have them praying to Mary instead. But the psalmist says that God alone hears prayers. So the only answer they'll get from Mother Mary is let it be. <laughs> we're going to get nasty notes on YouTube again. What? So we're going to get nasty notes on YouTube again. Probably, but oh well. Or we, 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 we are Lutheran and, uh, we do not, we honor the saints. By the way, I, just, you know, well, I might say something about that in, in terms of apparition and prayer to Mary. We do need to honor Mary. You know, um, you know, she says in, in, in her Magnificat, um, all generations will call me blessed. You know, she is indeed greatly blessed. She had the honor of carrying God within her womb. You know, mm-hmm. That is that is an honor that is far greater than any honor any person on this earth has ever had. You know, the she she God highly, um, you know, the, the angel Gabriel said God highly graced her, God highly favored her, uh, and God gave her yeah. something. But at the same time, what God highly did that that was purely by grace. Um, yep. And uh, she too needed a savior, the same savior she brought into the world. And I think Mary right. would be the first one to say, don't look at me. Look at my son hanging on a cross for you. Right. It's that great line, um, my favorite Christmas hymn. Well, okay, my favorite Christmas hymn is What Child Is This? But my second favorite Christmas hymn is Mary, Did You Know? Which isn't really a hymn, I guess. But um, my favorite line is, did you know that this child that you delivered would soon deliver you? Mm-hmm. Love that line. I, and I suppose because of that line, you'll never actually hear it sung in a Roman Catholic church. And if you do, it, it's contradicting their teachings. Um, but yeah, it's it's all about God's grace. It's all pointing to what God does for us, not what anybody else does for us. Otherwise, you're back in, you know, otherwise you're back here. And, you know, back to community and, you know, whatever else. So, Speaking of pointing to what God has done for us, Brings us to this really is a long article on Christianity Today about the need for liturgy. Uh, now, mm-hmm. um, Christianity Today is evangelical reformed in its, in, in its origin, and what's really interesting is to see how it has been interesting for me how uh, um, um, many of these evangelicals have, in Robert Reber's words, gone on the Canterbury Trail and have realized the real, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's the name of the book, Robert Weber's book, uh, Evangelicals on the Canterbury Trail, and have seen a real depth in liturgical worship. Um, that, uh, you know, and it's, he starts off the article, and interesting, he's talking about the relevant church, and we talked about the relevant church. It was the one that said, you know, uh, 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 have sex every day for 30 days. Um, and, you know, he's saying, well, what's really relevant? And how about this transcultural, thousands of years old liturgy uh, that really points in every way to the glory of God? Yeah, I thought you know, he made this this awesome point about when we say relevant, and you know, and talk about making the church more relevant. Really, what we're talking about is making it more meaningful for one particular group. And as he says, in North America, usually means twenty somethings and young families. You know. You talk about contemporary liturgy and, and stuff like that. Of course, contemporary liturgy, are you talking like what like evangelicals call contemporary liturgy, which is geared toward like 20-somethings and young families? And then there's like the Lutheran version of contemporary liturgy, which is what most people call like blended um, worship, which is actually more geared toward like baby boomers because it's um, it's mostly folk music. and um, and you know, and so, but either one of them, what they what they will do for the most part is um, alienate 
anybody older than that. I mean, that's the reason that at the church that I'm at, I can't do a contemporary service. It's not that I'm necessarily against them, but it's the fact that um, that we only have one service each Sunday. And we've got a lot of members in the 65 and over range that would just not feel comfortable. I mean, I do matins, and some of them feel uncomfortable. That's okay. I and, feel and uncomfortable that's very much we do matins, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have a new director of music coming on, and he actually spent the night here at the house last night, and I was talking to him and saying, okay, it would never, I would not hurt my feelings if we never did matins again, and I don't think it would hurt too many other people's feelings either. Um, but um, actually, we want to develop. He and I want to develop a, a more blended um, contemporary alternative worship service. That's one of our goals. Um, but well, see, now, something I'll, I want to do. Uh, on the other hand, let me tell you. I want to develop. Okay, go ahead. You know, talk about you know getting things older. My mom preferred a blended contemporary style. You know, and my dad, who's eighty-five oh, yeah. years old, I mean, he he really likes this blended style of worship they have at his church. My mom used to tell me, she goes, yeah, I really like it when we use guitars in worship. <laughs> <laughs> that was the way my mom pronounced the, the word guitar. It was guitar. And uh, it was, uh, but she enjoyed it. And she uh, really, I remember her telling me, you know, they had, because um, the church they went to, it, well, the, the first church they went to, um, had three worship services. One of them was called the family service, and it was, much more relaxed and you, you kind of really is a blended form. And my mom really liked that. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is kind of a side note, but since we're talking about liturgy and contemporary versus uh, traditional and things like that, one thing I'd really like to see, see the, my, my biggest hang up actually about the, the thing that bothers me the most about um, the liturgy, at least as we have it in the Lutheran church, Missouri synod um, is that it's all copyrighted. So we can't, and, and most of the music we use from the hymnal is copyrighted. Even though it's like, you know, these 500 year old hymns. Well, this particular arrangement is copyrighted. And you can't get permission to, um, to put it up on the internet. And so I would really like to put video of our services on the internet, like as a podcast or to be able to go and watch it at our site or something like that, so that people that can't make it to church for one reason or another, or people that are just not close to a church, um, you know, yeah, they can they can listen to the sermon as a podcast, but they can't watch the whole video. They, you know, they can't mm -hmm. see it, they can't, you know. And so I'd really like to be able to make that available, but legally, I can't. And so what I'd really like to see is an, um, is an open source uh, movement within liturgy and hymnody, that um, are using like a Creative Commons license. Uh, if you're curious what that is, creativecommons.org. Um, and the idea is that you put the stuff out there, you retain rights to it, but you say, all right, under certain circumstances, you can use it without having to pay for licensing and you know and mm -hmm. getting specific permission, as long as you credit the person that that actually um, created it. And you know you can say like, as long as you're not making it's it's a not for profit kind of thing or whatever. And um, you know, to be able to do that so that people can use the stuff and be able to put it out there. Uh, the, so. uh, yeah, there's um, the word, the, 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 the liturgy in uh, the old TLH, uh, technically, you can still use with no problem. You should be able to put that up with no problem because... Um, nope. Uh, no, nope. CPH renewed the copyright. Yeah. It was uh, in public domain, and when they came out with the Lutheran Service Book, they renewed the copyright on it um, using the old Mickey Mouse clause. And um, that's right, forget about the Mickey Mouse so, clause. Or actually, now yeah. better known as the Superman so, clause. Oh yeah. Since uh, yeah, yeah, because but yeah, so it's it, you can't use it. It's so like any churches that were using it before Lutheran Service Book and they were, you know, putting it out there, um, they had to stop. And if they are still doing it, they're technically breaking the law. You know, I, that's that's a thing where I think, you know, we need to have common sense. And if, um, I, I, you know, I would say, you know, I, 
you want to come after me, come after me. You know, go ahead. But, uh, you know, I'm, you know, we're not doing this for, to, to make money. I'm not taking your book and selling it anywhere. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, we're doing this as, a, as an evangelistic outreach. And if you don't want to give us the license to do it, yeah. You because know, uh, it's interesting, I mean, looking through this, I mean, there's, you know, I can use quotes in the book of, you know, the old book of Common Prayer. And um, <clears throat> it, look to read how much of our common service uh, of, of that old TLH liturgy is out of, directly, word for word, out of the, the book of Common Prayer. Uh, matter of fact, if you read TLH, it, you know, they even say in, in their introduction, well, you know, we freely use anything that we found. But for the non-Missouri Synod Lutherans or younger ones, um, TLH is the Lutheran Hymnal, which was published in what, 1953? 1941. 41. 41. Service okay. book and hymnal used by the ALC and LCA was 1953. Oh, that's what I was thinking of. I always get those mixed up. So, but anyway, back to this, this thing. But there's this very, um, but it's neat. In his article here, he says, you know, um, the very rhythm of the service. Uh, the liturgy of the word, followed by the liturgy of the sacrament, uh, the praise that prepares us for the word, the confessions and prayer that guide our response to the words. The pattern has not been created by the church as it has been discovered. Um, once again, I mean, it, it's it's amazing to me, as this, this, this you know, long-time Lutheran here with 20-some years in this ministry, how the evangelicals, evangelicals are finally figuring out what, you know, we've been, it's been part of our heritage from day one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, he makes this other great point. He says, the liturgy from beginning to end is not about meeting our needs. The liturgy is about God. It's not even about God as the fulfiller of our need for spiritual meaning. It's about God as he is himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not about our blessedness, but his. The liturgy immediately signals that our needs are not nearly as relevant as we imagine. There's something infinitely more worthy of our attention, something, someone who lies outside the self. In other words, the liturgy is not about who you are and what you need. It's about who God is and, and in essence, what he gives to us. Mm-hmm. Because we think we know what our needs are, but God knows. And he has already provided for our greatest need. And that's the focus. And so, so it puts the focus on God. It puts the focus specifically on Christ. And, um, now I have to understand that there are, um, potential problems, uh, with using liturgy, especially if you use the same liturgy week after week, year after year. And that is that it becomes a rote thing. You're going through the motions and, uh, and you know, you stop thinking about what you're doing. You know, so there's something to be said for a little bit of variety just to kind of shake people out of their, um, out of their robotics. Right. And, um, so, you know, so I, I have no problem with variety, uh, you know, as long as it's, it's presented in a way that people are not lost. We, uh, you know. when I was, uh, received my call here to St. Luke's, the author, uh, the, the, the uh, call document said in terms of worship, that they wanted a routine, but not a rut. I like that. And so, so um, and I, no, I, 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 I tend to be fairly liturgical. I, I think it has its strengths. I think it has its weaknesses. And I think we just need to be realistic about that. What uh, concerns me is when some of our brother pastors talk about um, Lutheranism, uh, liturgy. Is, well, you know, they and they love using the term divine service. And sometimes I think they, you know, have, you know, rephrase that the divinely inspired service um, mm-hmm. and that, you know, you, 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 one I'll should like you, you never touch it or change it in any way, shape or form. Um, I'm just not there. Or if you, you know, or if you don't follow liturgical worship, um, then you're somehow sub Lutheran. You know, uh, Augsburg mm-hmm. Confession 7 is very, you know, says very plainly that as long as we agree on the gospel, there can be variance in other areas. Yeah, and I, um, you know, we talked a little bit last time about issues, et cetera. And uh, one time there, uh, this was a particularly good episode of it um, because I did used to listen to it um, now and again. And uh, uh, Professor Kurt Marquardt, who's a big name in the uh, Missouri Synod, uh, he is now uh, sainted. 
<laughs> and um, sorry about that. But <laughs> he was he was talking about uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox liturgy and um, and churches and, and things like that. Which, by the way, this picture behind me is a uh, Eastern Orthodox liturgy. Um, but uh, he uh, uh, the host of the show, Todd Wilkin, he says. So have Lutherans borrowed any bad um, habits or, or teachings from the Eastern Orthodox. And uh, Dr. Marquardt said, yeah, the idea that the liturgy is immutable that, um, and that, there's, that the, the liturgy determines who we are. Um, because that's, I mean, that's basically the Eastern Orthodox view is that liturgy, you get your doctrine from your liturgy. Whereas we say, no, we get our liturgy from our doctrine. Right. And that's the um, danger of the statement that people like to use, you know, uh, Lex Aranda, Lex, Lex, Lex Prita, what you pray, you will believe. Uh, and, you know, that's why we need a liturgy. Well, that may be true. Then please explain to me the Episcopalian Church. <laughs> Yep. So, um, matter of fact, it was interesting to me because to tie this with 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 uh, our woman there who um, you know believes nothing. You know, um, it used to be said of some people, all they have is liturgy; they no longer have any theology. I did not know that. Uh, but let's move on here because I uh, it's uh, uh, I don't want this to go too much longer tonight. I don't have any good segue. Um, it's interesting. Uh, uh, April 25th was the uh, annual day of silence by uh, the GSLN. What is that a picture of? It's the symbol. Oh, was it? Okay. Of the, the uh, day of silence. That's the day of silence. It's really obnoxious, isn't it? We can switch to that. It's a little <laughs> less in your face. Okay. Um, See, I was thinking that this would make a good preview um, thumbnail uh, on, uh, on YouTube. <laughs> cool. Anyway, so... so um, and so, you know, how do Christians handle that? You know, what do we do? Some of them uh, stayed home. Uh, some of them uh, uh, took part in, uh, you know, a, a day of prayer. Uh, one one wrote a student that said, "Be ha-, one high school student wrote, wrote a shirt that said, "Be happy, not gay." <laughs> Once he got the permission through the Seventh Circuit, U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, <laughs> Oh, one of them I thought was interesting was a few weeks later, it was called uh, A Day of Truth. And they wore T-shirts and passed out cards that said, I'm speaking the truth to break the silence. True tolerance means that people with differing, even opposing views can freely exchange ideas and respectfully listen to each other. It's time for an honest conversation about homosexuality. There's freedom to change if you want to. Let's talk. And then there was the Golden Rule Pledge promoted by Grove City College, uh, which basically said, you know, uh, um, you know, I pledge to treat others the way I want to be treated. Gosh, you ever thought of using the Golden Rule? (laughs) So just a little little background on this. Uh, This has been this uh, National Day of Silence is has um, gone on for 13 years now. And um, it's uh, April 25th, and it is described as a student-led day of action when concerned students from middle school to college take some form of a vow of silence to bring attention to the name-calling, bullying, and harassment, in effect, the silencing experienced by LGBT, that is, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender students and their allies. And so you be silent to show that these other people have been, you know, silenced out of fear. And so, you know, on the one hand, you've got groups that, uh, like the American Family Association and Concerned Women for America that are saying, all right, you know, don't go to school that day if the school is sponsoring something like that. Um, and, you know, having protests and things like that, which, as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't do any good. You're not going to, you're not going to change hearts by boycotting. In fact, what you're going to send a message is, is that we agree, um, with this sort of, um, uh, discrimination and, and you know and, and stuff like that, and then um, this this T-shirt thing. I thought that doesn't really help anything either. Um, 
I'll defend his right to wear it, though. Not that I, you know, I don't agree with it, but I think he should have the right yeah. to wear it. But it's interesting, actually. My daughter had a friend of hers who was a member of her high school's Gay Street Alliance, and she was over at the house one time, and we were talking about, uh, I, I was, it wasn't that shirt, it was another one like that, and, you know, he, the kid got in trouble for wearing it on, on, on the Day of Silence and stuff. And she's like, she, she, you know, she's like, I thought that was hypocritical. You know, she's like, you know, he got the right to his opinion just as much as I did. He shouldn't be punished for having a point of view, even if I disagree with it. Oh, that was interesting. Go ahead, your comments on these. That, that was what she said. Yeah, that was she said. good for her. Because, yeah, the, I mean, you know, and that's the whole thing is, is um, I, I kind of like this day of truth thing. Um, the idea that, okay, look, here's the thing. Everybody should have the right to, to speak what they believe. And, and not just people from a particularly favored, uh, minority or, you know, or something like that. That doesn't give that group of people more rights than anybody else. Mm-hmm. And so this day of truth thing's been going on for seven years. And, you know, and, and the idea is that, okay, you know, I'm not going to be silent. I'm going to talk. All right. Let's talk about this because by being silent, yeah, you're, you're making a point, but, you know, at the same time, what we need to do is talk about this. Um, but I also like, I mean, the Golden Rule Pledge is kind of a, it, it's a good starting point, you know. The, the point is, is is that we need to communicate as Christians that I am against, um, I, I believe that homosexuality is a sin, all right? Um, and it's a, the, the tendency is a result of living in a fallen world, and Acting on it is a sin just the same way that um, acting on on alcoholism is a sin, you know, regardless of a person's tendencies or, um, you know, or the source of that or anything else. The source is ultimately sin, that we live in a sinful, fallen world. And, um, and but because, just because a person uh, acts in a certain way or, or uh, has preferences in a certain way does not give us the right to... Um, to persecute them or to, you know, to make their lives difficult or anything like that. You know, all people deserve respect, not because what they're doing is necessarily okay, but because these are people that Jesus died for. You know, Jesus loves these people, and so who are you to not love them? You know, who are you to, to take people that Jesus died for and make their lives difficult and, um, you know, and, and persecute them in some way. Now, at the same time, we need to stand up for the truth. We need to say, you know, I really believe this is sin, but that doesn't mean I'm going to love you any less. That doesn't mean that I'm going to make your life difficult. And in fact, if anything, I'm going to go out of my way to help you as much as I can to show you Christ's love, to show you what real love is. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this before. You know, it's a uh, <clears throat> that's what that, that's that's what the, the the thing is here. It's a um, uh, <clears throat> that's that's what it's all about. It's showing God's great love for all people, regardless of who they are or anything else, and um, and that's what we're all about. And uh, sometimes it gets hard, especially when we're dealing in king with the left hand issues but you know we got to stay away from from anything that shows people hatred um i wouldn't support the day of the day of silence i would participate in it myself um i think i would go with that idea of the golden rule the day of truth thing yeah if you're respectful with the other people but some mm-hmm. people yeah you know, i mean you really got to watch how you do it really couldn't do that but. But otherwise, I'm going to start telling stories you've already heard. So we're going to drop it right there. <laughs> I was just being truthful. <laughs> but you didn't treat me as you would like to be treated. You know, it hurt my feelings. Now, if you think my feelings have been hurt, and you want to defend me against this cool brute who's been making fun of me, you can always send us a comment at podcast 
at crossfeednews.com. Or if you want to get mad at me because I've insulted people that I didn't think were particularly good looking when I'm not myself, then you can say, God, you're ugly too. Uh, you know, you can also podcast at crossfeednews.com. So, um, or you or can even call you know, us. Maybe. <laughs> I haven't renewed it. Okay. But it might still work. Um, 206-350-4749. Or you might get somebody else entirely. <laughs> Somebody call and find out. Or you can click this sucker in iTunes, and it'll take you to our comment page. Or if you're watching this on YouTube or something like that, you can put a comment, and we'll get notification that the comment's been there. Yeah, or you can send us a message. or Yeah, there's a bazillion ways to get a hold of that. us. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, shout out to George. This week. Um, I uh, think the Marvel George Bowling, he, that, um, he sent us a note. What? And George... He, he sent us a note, um, it was like uh, a couple days ago, and uh, and just said, "Hey, are you uh, are you still doing this, or you know, Japod fade kind of thing?" And uh, and so so thanks, George. Makes feel needed. So appreciate that. But uh, nobody else noticed. So. <laughs> well, at least we heard from him. Yeah. So. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend in God's grace. Have a joyous. A special festival, not only of Pentecost this week, and maybe it's nice that Dale's got this Pentecost red behind him, uh, <laughs> but yeah, also, isn't that. it kind of interesting, the day of silence, um, Pentecost red, the day of, you know, speaking in tongues, that's kind of an interesting comparison. But also, we, mm. we also hope all the moms out there have a very good Mother's Day. Yep. Yep. And, uh. Chances are it'll be Trinity Sunday before you see the next one after this. So uh, have a blessed Trinity Sunday as well. Thank you.